Welcome everyone to this talk on KTOR, uh, otherwise pronounced KTOR. In, in fact, if you're wondering where KTOR comes from, it comes from the idea of constructor. Uh, so I'm going to give you a brief introduction on the past of KTOR, uh, the present, and then I'll show you a little bit KTOR, and then I'll talk to you briefly about the future of KTOR. So let's start with why KTOR, or what is KTOR? It's an OSS framework that is used for creating server and client applications. So whether you're creating server-side applications, HTTP endpoints, uh, REST and services, or you want to do client developments, like talking to HTTP or sockets, you can use KTOR for that. And there's multi-platform with a star, except I didn't put the star. Uh, but the point being that right now, the multi-platform part is client-side. On the server-side, we're working to provide it on a multi-platform as well, not only on the JVM, but also on native and JavaScript eventually. To give you a little bit of history, um, let's first take a look at the frameworks that existed for Kotlin when it came to uh, web development. So other, obviously at the time, you know, Sebastian has just covered uh, Spring and Spring has always been around and uh, they, they started to create uh, wrappers for Kotlin and endpoints for Kotlin, but as a JVM framework, uh, you could always use Spring. But there was an initiative by a gentleman from a external company at some point to create Kara. And if you're not familiar with Kara, uh, it's, it's a Ruby on Rails for Kotlin, essentially. Uh, if you're not familiar with Ruby on Rails and you know a little bit .NET, it's ASP.NET MVC, essentially, or Grails in, uh, in the JVM world. And then there was another framework called Wasabi, which was an attempt to do kind of like Express JX for Kotlin. Now, Wasabi was by myself, uh, which I eventually uh, deprecated to, to continue work and efforts on uh, KTOR. And the interesting fact right now is that uh, the Kara, which is kind of like the Ruby on Rails aspect, as I mentioned, there is now a framework that is trying to implement uh, Kara, but on KTOR. So we've come full circle with this. So KTOR in itself was initiated by Ilya Rijenkov, one of my colleagues that, that uh, used to the uh, Resharper team, and then now is working as a product manager on Space. And it was inspired by Kara and Wasabi. And apart from being a framework itself, it served multiple purposes. One of them was to explore Kotlin as a DSL tool to see where we could uh, take it and how we could define things using Kotlin. Uh, base library usage, so some of the other libraries that we're working on, especially around multi-platform, have a, a playground and place to, to use it, and of course, code routines. And, and KTOR is built from the ground up now using code routines. So it's all embedded uh, from the very core. So KTOR caught on. Uh, it started to be used externally. It also started to be used internally. Space, which is our uh, collaboration ID, uh, collaboration integration team product, uh, had decided to go with uh, KTOR as well. And we had multiple internal projects that started using it. So it started to also get external contributions, otherwise known as pull requests. And there was a problem. And the problem was that we started to get all of these pull requests. We started to get all of these issues. Uh, we started to get questions tagged on Stack Overflow. And you know, 2,000 plus people on the Slack channel on uh, Kotlin Slack, and uh, the minor issue there was that there were really just two uh, quote-unquote part-time developers on KTOR. And, and when I talk about part-time, it's not that they were literally part-time on KTOR, but KTOR right now has, has things that eventually may not belong in KTOR, but just are auxiliary libraries uh, that are used in the multi-platform part. So they were developing these libraries and also KTOR. So, that brings us to today, and we have quadrupled our team size. Now, that sounds way better than me saying we now have eight people on the team, right? If I just say we quadrupled our team size and you didn't pick up on the fact that it was initially two people, it sounds fantastic. But we have, we've got more developers, we've got a, a support engineer, uh, we have uh, marketing, we have developer advocacy, there, there's a whole bunch of people now that are working, technical writers, etc. So this is going to allow us to move much, much faster. And some of the changes that we've already made, uh, we've got a new site, we've got a new blog, and we've got a new Twitter account. Now, if 
if the Twitter account is the main thing that stops you ever from adopting a new technology, you can now safely adopt JetBrains KTOR because it's going to be around. We have moved to semantic versioning. And the reason for this is to give our users, our customers, better insight into any potential breaking changes. We have also committed to three major minor releases a year. And in addition to that, we will be releasing monthly patches. One of the things that uh, many users of KTOR complained about was that our release process was very, very infrequent. So we are now committed to making patch releases with fixes and then three major slash minor releases per year. And obviously, to the extent possible, keep any breaking changes to the minimum. And if we do have breaking changes, we will be introducing a deprecation cycle. So if you're familiar with what Kotlin does, in that it says that in the next iteration, for instance, this uh, API or this what have you will be deprecated, we will be doing something similar, issuing a warning, and then in the next one, issuing you an uh, actual compiler error. So that gives you a little bit of history of what KTOR, uh, how it initiated, what it was, where it came from. And let's take a look at KTOR a little bit on the server and how you can play with it. So here is essentially your hello world or hello KTOR application. And you can see that it's encapsulated in a console application for uh, a Kotlin console application. So let's examine all of the different parts. We have here the server, which we are launching an embedded server. And the embedded server can use different engines, such as Netty, Jetty, Tomcat, a bunch of different ones, including CIO, which uh, stands for Coroutines IO, which is currently experimental. But that is the direction that we're taking to be able to provide multi-platform uh, KTOR on the server. So in this case, we're using Netty. And we're saying we're going to start the server on port 8080. Now, once we do that, we then define a route. So this is part of the whole DSL aspect that I was talking about with uh, Colin. And what we're doing here is saying we're going to define a new route or route, depending on where you're from. And inside that, we're going to define a single route, which is get on the homepage. So in this case, slash get. And when someone makes the call to that, we are essentially going to respond with hello, Cator, and set the content type to text plane. So that is essentially it. If we were to run this, it will open up in the browser, which we'll see shortly, and basically respond with a uh, hello Kator. Now, a Kator application can consist of multiple modules. And each of these modules is really up to you on how you want to define them. It can be, for example, a group of similar uh, functionality in your application. Let's say, for instance, you have an, a, an ERP system and you want to uh, group things by uh, administrative tasks and um, you know, planned floor tasks or what have you. You could define these as modules. You can define modules as individual aspects of your application, such as, for example, a customer module, uh, orders module. It's completely up to you. Or you can have your entire application in a single module. It is just basically a way for you to uh, group your application the way you want. You don't have to necessarily use it. Inside these modules, each module then has the k application itself. So you have the pipeline where you make a request. It goes through a routing mechanism. It then passes that uh, request over to your application logic, which is where you're doing all of your computation. You're doing all of your uh, storage, reading, writing, what have you. And then you send out a response. Very simple and straightforward. Now, KTOR also has this concept of a feature, which you may be familiar with in other technologies, often referred to as an interceptor or middleware or filter, depending on your background and the other framework that you've used. And these features can be placed pretty much everywhere. They can be placed before request, after, after request, before processing, another request. Anywhere that you can think of, you can place these features. And then these features could be different things. So for instance, you can have an encoding, you can have compression, and even routing itself is a feature, which basically comes uh, quote unquote out of the box in that we essentially feel that you know, any k application needs routing. But under the covers, routing itself is essentially a feature too. So let's switch over to some code and let's take a look at demos and then we'll come back uh, and look at some sites. So, here I've got a series of applications. Now, 
this main function is a little bit different to what I just showed you previously. In this case, what we have is we're saying that instead of running the defining the actual K tor application and the routing inside the main function, what I'm saying is just essentially load uh, an engine of type Netty and read the arguments for the configuration of that through the arguments passed in the command line. And if I do not pass any arguments in the command line, it is going to default and try and find what's called the application configuration file, which we have over here. And this is where I define my port and I define the different modules that my application consists of. And as I mentioned, you can have multiple modules. Uh, in, in my case, I'm just going to have a single module for each demo, and then I'll just comment the one that we're going to be using. So this then takes me to the actual module itself. And if I go to this module, which in this case would be simple KT, we can see that there is the similar code that we saw before without the embedded server. That part has been done over here. Now, the reason for this is that generally, this is how you would have your uh, production time application, right? You would have a application.com file where you define the parameters, meaning that you don't need to recompile your application if you want to change your port or something like that. So here I essentially have my routing. I do my hello world content type text plain. And then for me to run this, I come to my application and hit run. And this should load up the module, which is the simple KT. So this is going to compile the application and then open it up in the browser. So let's just go to the project. And we're running it. And we see that it's saying it's responding at 008080. And there we have our hello world. Okay. Very simple. And if we take a look at the source page, there's not much other than just hello world. So let's see what else uh, we can do with Ktor. Now, one thing that Ktor already comes with out of the box is support for static pages. So if I want to load some static pages, all I have to do is just specify the resource and where those files are. So in this case, what I'm saying is that anything that's under the URL static is going to be static. That means it has to physically be on the file, on the disk, and that could be a resource that is physically there a file or, for instance, read it from an actual resource file. So in this case, I'm saying that anything that is static has to be located in the folder static, which we have up here. And I have a logo of Ktor. Now, if we run this application, so notice that the only thing I've changed is just commented out the modules and run the new module. We come back and we still run the same application and it loads quite fast. We open it up. Now that gives me an error as expected because there is nothing listening on that URL. But if I do static ktor logo.svg, I will get an error because I don't know how to spell. So if I do static, then I get my logo. Okay. So just basically adding this functionality of static allows us to have different static resources on our file. Now let's dive into how we can combine this with some other libraries that are provided by Kotlin. So some of you may be familiar with uh, Kotlin X HTML, otherwise known as using Kotlin to define HTML. Sometimes when I show this to people, they scringe and they kind of like go, this is this is completely and utterly wrong. What are you doing? Why, why are you writing uh, you know, HTML inside Kotlin code, you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and I say, yes, OK, and please show me your React application, right? Uh, JSX is essentially the same thing. Here I get nice static typing. So I can write body, I can write uh, H2, and get all of my code completion, etc. And we can combine this easily with Ktor. So again, if I run my application, I can see that now, in this case, what I'm saying is that if I access the HTML DSL route, that's going to give me some HTML. So we come here, paste that, and we can see that we get our HTML. And we get nice, clean HTML, right? There is nothing there. There's no 6,000 lines of JavaScript and 200 
thousand lines of CSS and uh, jQuery and everything else that you could potentially think of that you could drag into your web application just to have a bullet list of items. Like the good old days when we actually used to write pure HTML. So you have support for that as well. So let's all go over and see something a little bit more quote unquote complicated, which is uh, posting information. So right now we've seen how to do a get. And the get essentially is just uh, you know defining what the response is. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm doing a little get that is going to return a form which has two fields. One is of type input, and the other one is of type file. And then I have a post section which is going to receive that feed form and process it. So you can see here that already Ktor has support for multi-part uh, form data. So I can see that if the call is uh, receive a multi-part, if it is of type multi-part, then I can go through the items of the, the multi-part form and process each one individually. So if it's a field, I can say that I can access the value. If it's a file, I can access the file name, the content type, etc. So if we were to run this, and open it up, and we have the home page basically giving us the form where we can choose a file. For instance, let's say desktop over here, and I can say ticket, and I'll say an example, and send, and that tells me exactly the input field that I sent, as well as the name of the file and the content type. So out of the box, again, we have support for multi-part form and, of course, all of the different verbs of k Now, let's take a look at uh, some of these features that we've been talking about. In fact, we're going to now, we, we've used already one, which is routing, uh, but let's take a look at some other features. So in order to do, use a feature, a feature in k has two parts. It has the installation uh, initialization phase of the feature, and then it has the actual usage of it. So in this case, we have the installation and initialization, which is empty, but in a moment, I'll show you a feature that actually does have some initialization. But in this case, it's empty, and it's just saying, add default header support. So when I add default header support, it's going to add some default headers to every request response, which is the time, etc. So all I need to do is say, install the feature, and then this part is something we've already seen, which is get headers, respond, check the headers, etc. So let's run this one over here. And now if we access headers, and let's open up the tools so that we can see this. And we access headers, it says check the headers, and we'll let's go to elements. And we see that the headers is giving me back the actual values. Let's see, why isn't it? Uh, headers over here, it's seeing that I'm getting some uh, additional headers back, such as the date, etc. So this is just adding default headers, and of course I can add as many headers as I want to my request. But the point here being, this is how simple it is to actually add a feature, use it inside Ktor. Now let's see something a little bit more uh, advanced, so to speak. Nothing advanced, but a little bit prettier, or something that is more useful. So if we go to JSON, what I'm doing here is I'm adding content negotiation. So essentially what this means is that Ktor adds support, the ability for us to send back data in different formats in encoding. So I can send back JSON, I can send back XML, different uh, types of uh, serialization that I have. And in addition, it's adding support for content negotiation. Now content negotiation, for those not familiar, is the idea that the client is requesting a certain content type, for example, JavaScript slash JSON or text slash XML, and the server is responding with that content. But beyond responding, it also needs to negotiate. That means that if the client requests three different formats and the server cannot serve those, it should say that it cannot serve that type of content or it should fall back to the ones that the client accepts and it can serve. So by installing this content negotiation, it is providing this for us. 
And then the JSON here is that initialization part that I was talking about that some features have, which in this case, I'm saying I'm using JSON for serialization and I'm setting some properties of JSON, which in the case of JSON itself is set pretty printing or serialized null. Now, when I make a request to customer, all I do is just respond with the model. I'm no, not doing anything in terms of serialization myself. I'm just taking the data class and the customer is essentially a data class. In this case, it's not even a data class, just a class, and I am responding with it. So if we run this and access customer, we can see that we get our JSON back. Now, if we take a look at the headers, network and customer and headers, the content negotiation that I'm talking about is this part over here. We can see that we have an accept, and the accept has different uh, Q parameters, which is essentially saying, what is the weight of that? So the default weight is 1.0, so it's going to try and find the ones that are of type, for example, application JSON or application XML, and if it cannot, it will fall back to the other ones. These are the types that it accepts and the types that the server will then respond with. So that process of negotiating the type of content is also being done for you. This isn't just about serializing the output in a specific format. And all we do again is just install a feature. Now we have many other features. For example, we have authentication, uh, custom features, routing app, etc. So for instance, if we take a quick look at authentication, uh, let's see what we have here. Here we can have basic authentication, we can have OAuth. In this case, I'm just showing you basic authentication. And essentially what we do again is first install a feature, then initialize it. And here I'm saying that I want to provide basic authentication. Basic authentication has a realm. In this case, I'm also call it's, I'm calling it all sam sample. And then I'm passing in a validation, which is actually going to validate the code, which obviously you don't do this kind of thing in production. And you have the ability to set uh, ID principle, user ID principle, which then can be used throughout the session. So running this, it's essentially going to now allow me when I access anything that is under the authenticate auth segment, which is what's defined over here, is going to be authenticated. Anything that is not under that segment won't be. So the home page will not be. But if I try and go to slash secure, it's going to prompt up basic authentication. So if I type secure, ABC, ABC, and then I get access to that, uh, that secure resource. So this is just an example of using authentication with basic, but as I mentioned, there are other types of authentication. Now, the custom feature is, is very simple, uh, well, simple to implement, although we're trying to simplify that even more, uh, but you do have to, you do essentially have to implement a specific class. However, it does require you to know a little bit more about the internals. For, and for 80% of the cases, that's not necessary, and that's something that we're, we're working on to improve. But looking at a, kind of like a bigger application, uh, how would we actually work with KTOR in larger applications? So this is one thing that is somehow different with KTOR in comparison to some other uh, frameworks in that we're not really strict in how you want to structure your application. I mean, right now, every application sample that we've seen, we have seen that I've essentially created routes directly in a function and I'm basically loading that. So even in the case where I had a post, I had a get and a post here. Now, obviously that's fine for demo purposes, but you don't want to have your application with one big routing table with all of the contents. So you could just create a routing table and have each of these point to a function. Ultimately, at the end of the day, these are all lambdas. But there's different ways also that you can do this. So one way, for example, is to structure your application using extension functions. So for instance, I could have a function called home and put that function home in its own file and then have all of the routes associated with that in that file called home controller, home or, or customer or what have you. I could have these in different files. 
I could even have a class. I could even have a class that I would call home controller and then have the routes defined in that class home controller. You have complete flexibility in how you want to structure your application. And then you can, you know, there's some styles or, or conventions that people use. One of these is, for instance, grouping applications by packages, etc. I actually wrote a, a, a long uh, blog post, which is also available on the K12 website, on the benefits and disadvantages of the different ways you can uh, group your application structure. So if you're uh, interested in that, you can look that up on, on the website. And this is basically now uh, how you can structure your routes. But also what's important is that uh, in Ktor, you can have nested routes. So for instance, here, instead of having a get about uh, and then a post about and, and so on and so forth, and you know, and all the different verbs like delete, I could also do delete about, etc. I wish I, I think many of us would like to do a delete of about of, 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 of the company page, but anyway. What I could also do is a nested uh, routing. So I could say, for example, everything under employee and then define the different verbs. So I could do get, post, delete, etc. Okay. So how you want to structure application really depends on you and the benefits and disadvantages of each side. As I mentioned, you can take a look at some of the, uh, the, the blog posts that I wrote on, on, on the website. So. That's basically an overview of, of KTOR. And now let's just finish off with some plans on what we're doing in the future. So back to the slides a second. So what lies ahead? Uh, we're improving the onboarding experience. And this doesn't mean only documentation, but we're also making it easier for people to start with an application. I mean, now you can go to, to uh, if you're using IntelliJ, there's a, uh, there's a plugin. You can also go to start.kator.io, uh, but we're making that even better. We're also improving the development lifecycle experience. So we're improving everything to do with testing, with deployment, with all of the different phases of development of your Kator application. We are working on better tooling, better documentation, better guides, etc. In terms of client server, one of the things that you can use Kator for is, as I mentioned, client and server development, connected systems, or if you will, microservices. And while the client is there, we want to provide more functionality and more features to have that parity with the server so that it can communicate much better. The extensibility, as I mentioned, it's essentially, if you want to extend Kator, you just implement a class for a feature. However, we're making that even simpler so that for the majority of the cases, you don't need to know the ins and outs of Kator and simply uh, define your feature. We're being more attentive to performance. Generally, the performance is good. However, we notice that a lot of people take a notice of certain websites, such as, for example, test benchmarks, and we're not up to date on our tests there. And we're going to make sure that we, we try and be more up to date there and show the actual values aligned with each release. And of course, if there are performance issues, also work on improving those. And revamping the documentation. So one of the major complaints that we received around Kato was that the documentation was out of date, sometimes lacking. Sometimes you would copy a code sample and it wouldn't compile. We are completely revamping that. What you see right now on the website isn't that documentation. We've launched a new website with some new design. We've imported the existing documentation, but we are working on new ones and all of the samples are embedded and they're compiled and they're checked. And that means that every release and every documentation that is published will be made sure that it actually works. So if you have a copy and paste some code, it's going to be working for you properly. And last but not least, we are improving the tooling. We want to provide excellent tooling support, and we're going to be revamping the um, kind of like community contributed uh, uh, plugin that there was for, for Ktor. We're going to provide top notch new tooling, not only in the wizard, but also in the onboarding, adding features, uh, uh, navigation, code analysis, etc. And that's going to be available in IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate. So if you would like to find out more, please visit ktor.io. As I said, we've got a brand new website. It looks great. And hopefully any updates will be there soon. Thank you.